Thanks, Keith. So move the slides on, please, James. Thanks. Hi, everyone. So um, my name is Owen Bellamy. So I'm head of the uh, power sector team at the CCC. Um, so we've got a presentation for you here. It's about 20 to 25 minutes. I'm going to cover two main um, sections in the presentation. So we've got um, some slides on the kind of overall approach to the six carbon budget. Uh, so at the kind of economy wide level uh, and the target itself. And then we've got a section on specifically on the energy sector and uh, including um, electricity generation and hydrogen. So with a bit more detail on, on the, the kind of those specific parts of the analysis. So James, could you move us on please? Thanks. So um, I guess in terms of the approach to the six carbon budget as a whole, we looked at, at three main scenarios for how we could get to net zero by 2050. So that's a, um, an engagement scenario, an innovation scenario, and what we called a headwind scenario. And you can see on the chart there um, that those are split in, on, on the grid in terms of um, behavior change and innovation. So the widespread engagement scenario is a scenario which has um, high levels of, of behavior change. Um, so, for example, um, further action on um, dietary changes and uh, aviation. Um, on the innovation scenario, that focuses more on um, kind of particular reductions in, in costs and availability for key technologies um, at the high end of the kind of innovation um, spectrum. And then there's a third scenario called headwinds, which um, has less behavior change and less innovation than, than the other two scenarios. And that, that's kind of more dominated by um, infrastructure changes, for example, in CCS. So all three of those scenarios get to net zero by 2050, but they get there in different ways. Uh, and then James, if you click on, there is also a fourth and then a fifth scenario. So the tailwind scenario um, combines the extra behavior change that's in the engagement scenario and the extra innovation that's in the innovation scenario and combines those into um, a kind of optimistic, um, uh, very high end scenario, which actually gets to net zero before 2050. And then James, lastly, we have a, a, a kind of central balanced pathway, which the uh, six carbon budget recommendation is based on and which is designed to keep open the option of being able to um, achieve all of those exploratory scenarios by 2050 um, on the path to the six carbon budget in 2035. Um, so if you could move us on, James, please. So this chart then shows you the pathway for the, the carbon budget as a whole. So that's the balanced pathway uh, in purple there. And you can see that the uh, balanced pathway goes through uh, at least a 68% reduction in 2030, um, which is uh, the recommendation for the uh, UK's nationally determined contribution. And then a 78% reduction uh, in 2035 um, on the pathway to getting to net zero in 2050. And I guess the key point to highlight is that the pathway is slightly front, front um, uh, ended there uh, and we'll, particularly on electricity generation, we'll, we'll see the reasons for that um, in the coming section. Thanks. So, so moving on to the energy sector and in particular, electricity generation and hydrogen. Uh, so a few slides just highlighting the main kind of overarching changes uh, in energy demand uh, out to 2050. And this is for the balance pathway. So you can see a gas at the top there and oil demand um, by sector. Um, and both oil demand and gas demand fall very substantially by 2050 compared to today's levels. So um, oil is down 85% and gas is down 70%. And you can see for gas, uh, the kind of two big um, users of gas are, are yellow and green. So yellow is um, electricity supply. So We'll see there is still um, use of gas uh, as gas CCS in power generation, 
and also in fuel supply as well, uh, particularly to make hydrogen. Uh, and then oil, you can see almost all oil use phased out by 2050, except in the purple chunk there. And that purple chunk is aviation. So um, oil use, particularly petroleum, restricted to aviation um, in the long term. Uh, and gas um, used only for CCS and power generation uh, and in, 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 um, in fuel supply, particularly for production of hydrogen. And not used in buildings in the long term. And just a chart to show you um, the balance of hydrogen as well in, in the scenario. So the hydrogen economy, I guess, grows from, uh, from nothing today out to kind of very substantial levels in, in 2050. And again, this is the balance pathway. Um, but considering that the size of the current electricity um, generation sector is about 300 terawatt hours. We're looking here at a, um, a hydrogen sector, which is broadly equivalent in size to the electricity uh, generation sector today. And if we look at where that demand comes from uh, in the right hand side chart, you can see that I guess the two big um, sectors there are um, shipping and uh, which is the kind of pinky color above the yellow. Uh, and the light blue, which is manufacturing and construction. Those are the kind of two biggest uses of hydrogen uh, in 2050, but obviously also split across some of the ex other sectors to, to a kind of smaller extent. Um, and I guess the next biggest one you can see in yellow there um, is power generation, which leads us nicely on to uh, the next set of slides, which are particularly focused on um, power and electricity generation. So just showing you here the balance pathway um, and the demand for electricity under the balance pathway. So you can see here that demand for electricity um, goes up very substantially in the period from 2020 to 2050. So demand approximately doubles from current levels of around 300 terawatt hours up to uh, six to 700 terawatt hours um, in 2050. Uh, and that's split across uh, a number of sectors as we electrify, increasingly electrify uh, the rest of the economy. And in particular, the biggest new area of demand you can see there um, is in the purple wedge, and that's from um, electrification of, of surface transport. Um, but there is also electrification uh, across the scenarios of um, buildings, non-residential and residential, um, of manufacturing and construction, uh, and some other smaller sectors, as well as using electricity to produce um, hydrogen, which is, is the yellow bar at the top. So really, the story of, of the scenarios is a move away from fossil fuels and towards electrification where possible. So how do we generate that doubling of electricity demand by 2050? Well, this is a chart of, of the generation mix uh, over time and out to 2050. And I guess the key point is a, a very large expansion of, of variable renewables. So you can see the pink, um, the pink section there going up to 80% of generation from variable renewables by 2050. Um, there's a phasing out of unabated gas uh, for electricity generation by 2035 in the balance pathway. And that means that all generation from 2035 onwards is low carbon generation. Um, so the challenge over the next 15 years is to move to a low carbon system and then to meet the new electricity demands that are coming in a low carbon way. So you can see uh, an increase in, in variable renewables, uh, but also an increase in uh, low carbon dispatchable generation, which is the orange bar there. So that's generation to balance the variable renewables in a kind of mid-merit way. Um, and that's either in our modeling gas with CCS um, and or hydrogen. Um, also behind that is an increasingly flexible electricity system. So that includes um, things like um, demand side management. So from the expansion of 
uh, electric vehicles and heat pump demand, we can um, flex that demand um, on, on different timescales in order to manage the variability of, uh, of renewable generation. Require, it will require an increase in, in storage capacity. And there are very, a ver variety of technologies uh, which could play that role. Um, it will require an increase in hydrogen production and in particular using surplus um, electricity generation to create hydrogen. Uh, and also not shown on the chart, um, also interconnection will be important as well as a, an extra um, avenue for flexibility. So what does that mean for emissions in the power sector? Uh, well, hopefully everyone knows that um, the past 10 years for emissions in electricity generation have been very successful and in fact, the most successful of all the sectors in the UK economy. So emissions have fallen nearly 65% um, since 2010. Uh, and you can see that in the, in the black dotted line there. That's a result of moving away largely from coal towards renewables and some uh, unabated gas. The challenge over the next um, 15 years is to move away from the last remaining source of fossil fuels, um, the last remaining source of uh, emission, sorry, which is unabated gas generation. Um, in our scenarios that happens by 2035, you can see by 2035, emissions are, are very low. Uh, and then the challenge over the next 15 years after that uh, is to um, expand the use of low carbon generation. Uh, and emissions continue to fall slightly out to 2050 as uh, variable renewables take an increasingly larger share of the system uh, and as um, gas CCS capture rates increase as well. Um, so emissions in the power sector are um, almost completely decarbonized by, by 2035 and then um, low carbon from, from there on. Uh, just to touch on the role of hydrogen uh, in electricity generation. So hydrogen actually has a kind of dual role in our um, scenarios uh, for electricity. So also uh, a source of uh, low carbon generation itself, but also a, um, a potential new demand for electricity as well. Um, so it can be produced uh, using electricity or by methane reformation. Uh, with CCS and the role between electrolysis and methane reformation changes somewhat over time as the cost of those technologies changes. So in the 2020s, um, there's a focus more on methane reformation with CCS. Um, that's because um, the cost of electricity would be need to be relatively low in order for electrolysis to be cost competitive. Uh, but from the 2030s onwards, as the cost of renewables falls um, and as um, the potential for using surplus generation um, to, um, to provide that, that electricity increases, then that makes uh, the role of electrolysis in hydrogen production more attractive. And you see the balance um, shifting towards uh, more towards um, electrolysis compared to the 2020s. And in fact, by 2050 in the balanced pathway, um, not only is there nearly 200 terawatt hours of um, domestic hydrogen production, that is evenly split between um, gas CCS and, um, sorry, between methane reformation and um, electrolysis. So just to touch on um, costs, I've got a couple of slides on um, the costs of the different technologies and then what that means in, in aggregate for electricity generation. Um, so just to briefly um, show you the costs that are assumed across the scenarios. Um, so um, the balance pathway and um, the headwinds and engagement scenarios take a relatively um, somewhat conservative view on renewables costs, so they fall slightly. So these are in 2019 prices, um, which are slightly higher than 
the 2012 prices that are often quoted. Um, so that would be the equivalent of 35 pounds for variable renewables um, in 2050 on a 2012 um, price level basis. So a, a slight fall in, in renewable costs out to 2050. Um, in the innovation and tailwind scenarios, we assume um, much more significant reduction in, in the cost of renewables, um, approximately halving compared to um, the levels um, seen today. And that obviously changes the balance of uh, electrification across those scenarios. And um, the innovation scenario and the tailwind scenario are therefore um, have a higher level of electrification driven by those lower renewable costs. Um, firm power, so in particular nuclear, uh, we see as being more expensive than renewables, even out to 2050. Um, and dispatchable um, low carbon power um, with gas CCS at the low end of that range being um, competitive with um, firm power, but BEX slightly more expensive and, and towards the higher end of that range there. So what does that mean in terms of um, kind of more aggregate costs for electricity generation? So this slide shows the additional investment costs in the dark blue line and the additional operating costs in the yellow line there of moving to net zero compared to running a fossil fuel based power system. So you can see in terms of investment costs, um, those kind of peak in the um, early to mid 2030s, particularly as we're expanding um, supply, um, but, while costs, um, but while technologies are still being deployed and while costs are still coming down. So we see investment costs falling um, from the kind of mid 2030s onwards as the cost of those technologies um, starts to fall once they've been deployed at scale. Um, but in terms of operating costs, um, obviously the cost of these technologies in particular, given that the system is dominated by renewables, which have no input costs in terms of their fuels, actually running a um, variable renewable based system is cheaper than running a fossil fuel based system. So actually there's large potential savings uh, on the operational cost side. And by 2050, those savings outweigh the additional investment that's, that's required in that system. So by 2050, actually the balance pathway is cost saving. Um, so you can see um, the minus 10 outweighs the plus five there um, compared to um, it's cost saving compared to, to a high carbon equivalent system. Um, there's also obviously a range of unquantified benefits that would, that would come with moving to a net zero system. So I've listed a few of them there and we haven't attempted to quantify these in the report, um, but those co-benefits could include um, improved air quality, um, potentially lower electricity prices, uh, and also industrial opportunities um, for an expansion of, of some of these kind of key growth industries and also employment opportunities um, for a just transition. So what are the policy recommendations for the power sector uh, that, that flow out of that analysis? So I've highlighted five um, key policy recommendations that we have described um, in the report. So the first one is that we need to um, deploy low carbon electricity generation at scale starting in the 2020s. Um, so on the renewable side, we need to move up towards a system which is um, heavily based on renewables in the long term. That means um, achieving the 40 gigawatt target for offshore wind by 2030 that the government has. And in the balance path, they're going up to 100 gigawatts of offshore wind. And in the innovation scenario, potentially up to 140 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2050. Uh, we need to develop the markets for um, dispatchable um, low carbon generation, so gas CCS, gas CCS and hydrogen, uh, in order that we can phase out unabated 
um, gas by 2035. If I skip to that one next, um, we think the government should commit to phasing out unabated gas for power generation by 2035. We think that's cost effective. Uh, they need to publish next year uh, a comprehensive strategy for actually achieving that. So demonstrating how the markets for um, variable renewables and that dispatchable low carbon generation uh, can be developed in order that that can um, uh, drive unabated gas off the system. Um, and then we think by 2030, they should be in a position to um, regulate for no new build of unabated gas plant and also for a firm pathway to, to zero unabated gas by 2035, subject to um, ensuring security of supply. Um, that plan will also need to cover um, the development of a, a flexible electricity system. Um, so putting in place the measures to enable um, more, more demand-side management uh, and also bringing through the storage, hydrogen production and interconnection that would be required um, to deliver that system. Um, and then lastly, um, there's an important question about networks. So we need to make sure the electricity networks can accommodate that doubling and potentially tripling of electricity demand that will be coming in the long term. And that's actually not necessarily something that can be put off. So um, our scenarios have a 50% increase in electricity demand by 2035 um, compared to current levels. So this is something which is gonna to need to happen um, early on in the 2020s in order that we can put those investments in, in place and, and future-proof the network. And I guess lastly, there is a question about the overall market framework um, for delivering net zero. Uh, and we think they should um, publish um, a long-term strategy for how the electricity market is gonna function in a net zero world, which is gonna be dominated by um, zero marginal cost generation. So variable renewables with no fuel costs, um, which is gonna need a kind of different market structure compared to the current market structure which has been developed over the last couple of decades um, and mostly focused on a kind of more thermal based system. So we think they need, they need to bring forward that market framework um, as soon as possible and, and definitely before 2025 in order that the changes that are required can be put in place on the timeframes that are needed. Um, so just a couple of more slides to go. So just again, a kind of slightly more infographic version of the previous slide, but just to highlight that um, uh, the electricity sector needs to be basically fully low carbon by the mid 2030s. Uh, and that means actually the policies for delivering that need to be thought about in the um, coming decade and, and definitely over the next um, kind of well, definitely in the first half of the 2020s, I think you can see from the, um, the boxes at the bottom, just pulling out the key points. So um, we need to put in place the policy framework and the markets um, within the next few years in order that they can be deployed at scale and that the system can be completely decarbonized by, by 2035. And then the challenge after 2035 is to deploy that um, and keep up with the increase in demand. So I think just one more slide on hydrogen. Um, so I'm not going to cover all of these, but just to kick, to kind of pull out the key points in, in purple there on hydrogen supply. Um, so I think hydrogen uh, needs to be focused on areas that, that cannot feasibly decarbonize without it. That means we need to get on with um, developing the supply chains to bring forward that low carbon hydrogen. And we talked about um, the kind of balance between um, methane reformation and electrolysis already. And then we also need to make sure that um, that low hydrogen is incentivized to contribute to emissions reductions, but that it doesn't bias 
those solutions towards hydrogen um, in the cases where electrification is competitive. So we want to see a level playing field, not to reuse that word too much in the current circumstances um, uh, for, for both uh, hydrogen and um, electrification. I think that should be it, James. Thank you. Thanks very much.